Siegfried, Prince of Xanten, hero of the Nibelungen lead, and guy who apologizes way too freaking much. But what about the Siegfried of Fate Grand Order? How well does he compare to his mythical counterpart? And what grade would I give his depiction? Let's get into it. Siegfried is a Saber class servant, which is one of those no-brainer choices. Siegfried is explicitly a sword wielder, having acquired the sword Balmung as a treasure during his adventures. So, swordsman in the legends, swordsman in the Fate franchise, what more else is there to say? Getting into his character design, Siegfried has always reminded me of an 80s rock star thanks to his amazing hair, especially when he gets into a summer costume. Look, I had to say something about it. I've always thought that, and I can't be the only one. More seriously, Siegfried does look the part of a warrior, though when you are actually looking at him closely, you can't help but notice that he's not actually wearing much armor. Also, what's the deal with his shirt that isn't really much of a shirt, blatantly showing off his physique both in front and back? Is this fan service? No, this is lore related, to the point that it's one of his MPs, Armor of Fafnir. In Siegfried's legend during his duel with the dragon Fafnir, he was soaked in the dragon's blood, hardening his skin to the point of making him all but invulnerable. That is, except for a point upon his back where a leaf had stuck to him, giving him a rather famous weak point. You may recall in Fate Apocrypha, when the Black Faction servants were all introducing themselves, that Siegfried's master Gordas immediately stopped him from sharing his true name to the others. He wasn't just being a control freak. There is actually some real logic to that. Siegfried having a vulnerability upon his back is a famous weakness, much like Achilles and his heel. If his true name was widely known, that would be a very easy way to take Siegfried out. As for the rest of his design, much of it is just embellishments added by the artist. Since he has that glaring weakness upon his back, the artist decided to open his shirt on the front as well, then added that dragon tattoo upon his chest. There are also lots of crosses in Siegfried's design. His shoulders, his sword, his boots, those thigh guard things, and so forth. Siegfried wasn't a crusader or anything like that, but it does give the impression that he is from medieval Europe. As you move up his ascension forms, Siegfried gets increasingly draconic, to the point that in his final ascension, he has horns, wings, and even a tail. Siegfried wasn't a dragon, and he didn't become a dragon after slaying Fafnir, but he is a famous dragon slayer, so... okay? Notably, Siegfried's illustrator has said that Siegfried takes a lot of effort to draw, and so it was quite difficult to animate an FGO. Yes, even Siegfried's illustrator is apologizing. Overall, Siegfried's design is pretty good, with very clear links to his lore, even if I still think that he wouldn't look out of place in an 80s hairband. Moving into his skill set, Siegfried's first skill is Golden Rule, which upgrades into Avaricious Gold with the release of Traum. Golden Rule increases his MP gain for three turns, while the upgrade increases his attack for three turns as well as giving him a 30% MP charge. Golden Rule is a generic skill we've seen before on Edmond Dantes and Francis Drake, meant to represent one's ability to acquire wealth. In Siegfried's case, he found the Rheingold, a massive amount of treasure and magical items, including his sword, Balmung. I'll say more about what exactly is in the Rheingold later when I get to his craft essence. On another note though, this upgrade that makes this skill a 30% MP charge, this means that so long as you have the mana loading a pen maxed out, you can Buster Loop with Siegfried with a 50% CE. Whether or not he's actually a good looper, well, I doubt he's going to be replacing Artorio or Muramasa anytime soon. As for the upgrade getting its name changed to Avaricious Gold, well, let's just say that those who come across the Rheingold tend not to have happy endings. Siegfried's second skill is Disengage, which removes debuffs and heals Siegfried a bit. Disengage is a generic skill meant to represent one's ability to pull back from a fight, to reset the conditions of the battle to get away from a bad situation. This is pretty generic for Siegfried, but it still can kinda work for him. I said a fair bit about Siegfried's weak spot upon his back, how that is a crippling weakness for him. But aside from that weak spot, the man is practically invulnerable thanks to bathing in the dragon's blood. So while the skill's name is pretty bland, Siegfried having a skill that heals him and removes debuffs, that at least makes sense for him. Lastly, Siegfried's third skill is Dragon Slayer, which increases his damage and defense against dragons for three turns, with an upgrade also giving him a buster damage buff for a turn. Since Siegfried is well known for killing the dragon Fafnir, this, like him being a saber, is kind of a no-brainer. There's really nothing more that needs to be said about this one. Siegfried's 
Siegfried's noble phantasm is Balmung, whereupon he draws his sword, charges up a massive surge of energy, and then unleashes it upon his foes. This MP does damage to all enemies, with it doing extra damage to dragon enemies depending upon overcharge, as well as increasing his MP gain for three turns. Balmung is the sword that Siegfried found among the treasure Das Rheingold, and would be his weapon of choice for the rest of his days. Much like that Dragon Slayer skill, this MP is pretty obvious for Siegfried to have. Siegfried's craft essence is Das Rheingold, featuring a massive shiny gold rock. Das Rheingold is the treasure that Siegfried won in the realm of Nibelung. I mentioned it before when talking about why he has the skill Golden Rule. Initially, he was planning to split the gold between himself and two others who had also found it, but a fight broke out and Siegfried ended up killing them. So what's in this Rhine Gold? Well first, it is a massive pile of gold that ensured that not only Siegfried, but his descendants could live in luxury for the rest of their lives. Second was his sword Balmung, which I just covered. Lastly, there was also a cloak, the Tarn Kappa, which acts as both a cloak of invisibility and also multiplies the strength of its wearer by a factor of 12. We don't see this cloak in FGO as far as I know, but it does play a key part in Siegfried's legend. Something else that you might find interesting? Siegfried takes a sword and the cloak, but leaves the gold in the care of a dwarf named Alberic, who had been the original guardian of the treasure. A few decades after the Nibelungen Lied was written, this Alberic would appear in a French poem called Huon de Bordeaux, where he would become a powerful fairy king who helps the titular Huon in his endeavors. Since this was a French story, his name was changed from Alberic to Oberon. Nearly 400 years later, some jackass playwright in England would take this character and use him for one of his own works, A Midsummer's Night's Dream and change his name again from Oberon to Oberon. I mentioned all of this in my video on Oberon, but I thought I'd mention it here too because I think it's really neat. Anyway, moving on. Siegfried's Valentine CE is Dragon Cosplay, featuring a dragon costume made by Da Vinci. I'm not sure how to feel about this one. So Siegfried gives us a costume to dress up as a dragon, but he's a dragon slayer. Wait, does that mean he wants to kill the protagonist? That self-loathing prick. I knew all of those apologies were just to throw us off our guard. He's secretly a homicidal maniac. Or maybe it's a completely innocent gift. What do you think? I, for one, do not trust him. Now for characterization, starting with a look into the mythical Siegfried. But before I do that, I have to say something about Siegfried's legend. When we are talking about Siegfried, we are referring to the character who has grown out of Germanic legends, starting with the Nibelungen lead. The reason I'm specifying this is because there is another legend from Scandinavia that is very similar to Siegfried's, that of Sigurd, who is also a servant in FGO. Their legends share many of the same elements and many of the same characters, though they have different, albeit similar names. Siegfried and Sigurd, Brunhild and Brynhild, Krimhild and Gudrun, and so on. The legends of Siegfried and Sigurd are distinct enough to make them separate characters, but when it's time for me to do my videos on Sigurd and Brynhild, it's going to sound awfully familiar. Also, I'm actually considering combining them, making a Sigurd and Brynhild video rather than two separate ones. But that is an issue for another day. It has to do with how much the stories of Sigurd and Brynhild overlap, whereas Kriemhild has her own story after Siegfried's death. As I mentioned already, Siegfried's origin lies in a poem written around the year 1200, the Nibelungen Lied. Much like its exact year of writing is unclear, we also don't know who wrote it. Siegfried is the Prince of Xanten, which is a very, very old settlement that was on the front line of the Roman Empire. The kingdom that Siegfried is a prince of is often called Nederland, which, despite sounding awfully similar to Nederland, was not in fact the Netherlands. It's in Westphalia, or northwestern Germany. Fate Apocrypha makes this mistake, having Siegfried say that he is from the Netherlands when he first fights Karna. Anyway, Siegfried arrives in the court of King Gunther of Burgundy, hoping to woo the sister of the king, Princess Krimhild. To introduce him, one of the king's vassals, a man named Hagen, tells the tale of Siegfried's past exploits. Siegfried had won the treasure of Nibelung, the Rheingold which I discussed earlier, and had also slain the dragon Fafnir. Wait, you mean we don't actually get to see Siegfried kill the dragon? Not in the Nibelungen lead, at least. It is shown in the Wagner opera, but Siegfried in FGO is almost entirely based upon the poem, not the opera. So when Siegfried mentions in his first FGO interlude that he has no idea how he won, neither do we, because you don't actually see it happen in the poem. All those great deeds Siegfried accomplished? That's not what the Nibelungen lead is about. 
What it is about is King Gunther's desire to woo the Icelandic queen Brunhild, and all the tragedy that follows from that. Gunther wishes to take Brunhild as his wife, but she's kinda scary, so the king wishes to have Siegfried's help. Siegfried agrees on the condition that he be allowed to marry the king's sister, Kriemhild. So the two go off to Iceland, with Siegfried posing as a vassal of King Gunther. Remember that, it will become important later. Brunhild tells the king that she will only agree to marry him if he accomplishes some feats of strength. Feats that not only prove that Queen Brunhild is incredibly strong, but which are also way beyond the skills of King Gunther. Luckily, Siegfried has that invisibility cloak that also massively boosts his strength, so he decides to secretly help the king accomplish all of these feats. Satisfied, Queen Brunhild agrees to marry King Gunther, and Siegfried in turn gets to marry Kriemhild. But this deception doesn't last very long. When it is time for adventures to happen on the wedding night, Brunhild easily overpowers Gunther and ties him up. Humiliated, the king again seeks out Siegfried's help, and he agrees by again using his invisibility strength cloak to go beat up Brunhild. It is not clear if Siegfried then decides to spend the night with Brunhild, but he does take her belt and ring, both of which are considered symbols of one's chastity. King Gunther then is able to be with his new wife, and as a result Brunhild loses her great strength. Apparently it only lasted as long as her chastity did. Obviously what Siegfried and Gunther did here was less questionable back then, but it is most certainly a crime today. I do not approve. Notably, Siegfried decides to give Brunhild's ring and belt to his new wife, Kriemhild. Years later, Brunhild is still upset by the situation, or rather has chosen another part of it to be angry about, that King Gunther decided to marry his sister Kriemhild to Siegfried, who Brunhild still thinks is a vassal of Gunther rather than having his own kingdom. The two couples reunite, but then the two wives get into an argument about which of the two is more important. Brunhild points out that she is the wife of a king, while Kriemhild is just the wife of some vassal, and so clearly she is superior. Kriemhild rightfully corrects her by pointing out that Siegfried rules his own kingdom, but then she brings out the belt and ring Siegfried had taken from Brunhild, arguing that Brunhild is actually Siegfried's mistress. As you might expect, Brunhild is humiliated, causing a very serious problem. Siegfried and Gunther don't wish to fight each other, but Hagen, the vassal who had initially introduced Siegfried to Gunther, is deeply upset by the insult to his king. Hagen decides, and King Gunther reluctantly agrees, that Siegfried must die for this. Despite, you know, all of this being Gunther's idea from the start. Making up a false threat of invasion from another kingdom, Gunther asks for Siegfried's help to defend his kingdom. At the same time, Hagen asks Kriemhild to put a mark where Siegfried's weak point is, saying that he wishes to make sure that it is protected in the battles to come. As the invasion threat passes, Hagen and Siegfried go on a hunt in the wilderness. As Siegfried drinks water from a nearby spring, Hagen took the sword Balmung, then threw a javelin at Siegfried's back. Siegfried tried to attack Hagen, but without his sword he could do little but curse Hagen for this betrayal before succumbing to his wound. That night, Hagen would take Siegfried's body and dump it in front of his residence, where it would be discovered by Kriemhild the following morning. What happened after that is a story for another time. Shifting to the Fate franchise, we first meet Siegfried in Fate Apocrypha, where he serves as the Saber for the Black Faction. But this doesn't last for very long since Siegfried ends up being the first servant to die in Fate Apocrypha, having the misfortune of getting paired up with Gorda's music, someone who does become a better person later, but only after being a colossal failure of a master. Despite being killed off in Episode 4 of a 25-episode series, we do get a good peek into Siegfried's Fate backstory and it is noticeably different from his legend. While the details of how he helps Gunther get Brunhild as his wife are glossed over, probably because it was seriously immoral, he is still the mighty dragon slayer who became all but invincible. However, there are two major changes to Siegfried's story that drastically alter his character. The first is him being depicted as a wish-granter, for lack of a better word. We see flashbacks of Siegfried granting the wishes of everyone he comes across, always acting for the benefit of others, never for himself. It's the kind of life Shiro Emiya dreams of, and the one that Archer Emiya looks back upon bitterly. Siegfried wanted to be a hero, but he was always answering other people's wishes. So in Fate Apocrypha, when he gets the chance to be a hero on his own terms, he helps the unnamed homunculus out with all of his heart, literally. It's a nice little story, and it makes Siegfried come across as an extraordinarily selfless person. But this isn't what the mythical Siegfried was like. 
but the much more significant change to a story is how it ends. Rather than falling victim to a plot by Brunhild and Hagen with King Gunther's reluctant agreement, Siegfried instead basically commits suicide by cop. When the dispute between Brunhild and Kriemhild breaks out, Siegfried feels that it is his fault, since he was the one who helped trick Brunhild. So Siegfried asks Hagen to kill him, pointing out his weak spot, leading to Siegfried being killed at a water spring like he was in myth. These two changes end up drastically altering Siegfried's character, shifting him from a mighty warrior struck down by treachery, to instead becoming a selfless doormat who blames himself for everything, hence why the guy apologizes so much. It's practically all the guy does in the Orléans Singularity, apologize, apologize some more, and then fight Fafnir because John Alter is using him as her mount. It is a moment in the spotlight for Siegfried, but it isn't really important to his character. Neither are his appearances in events like Summer 4. As fun as it was to see Siegfried mimicking his Scandinavian counterpart by putting on glasses and pretending that they made him smarter, that's all it was. But we also have story content in FGO where Siegfried is forced to confront his past, and where the Fate franchise is forced to confront having changed it. You get a first taste of this in his second interlude, where he comes face to face with Hagen, the man who killed him both in Fate and the original myth. Hagen confronts Siegfried about having arranged for his own death, but making the critical mistake of not thinking about how others would react to that. Hagen himself says he considered Siegfried to be a friend, and so having to kill Siegfried hurt him deeply. Then Hagen mentions Kriemhild, and it is here that we find out that Siegfried didn't tell his wife that he was arranging his own death. It seems like Siegfried had such a low opinion of himself that he didn't think anybody would care if he died. But people did care, and Siegfried's lack of forethought would lead to even greater tragedy. Then we get to the events of Lost Belt 6.5, Traum, which was just released on the NA version of the game. If you haven't played that yet and don't wish to be spoiled, skip to the timestamp here. Siegfried only appears in Traum towards the very end, having been hidden away by Zhang Jue, but Kadok, who is suspicious about why Zhang Jue had that secret fortress, decides to venture there during the major battle between the Righteous and Reinstatement realms. Together with Moriarty, he discovers the imprisoned Siegfried. Despite being sealed away so carefully, Siegfried already knows that Kriemhild is here, and resolves to face her. He joins Chaldea and the Righteous Realm in their final battles, pushing until coming face to face with his wife. The two fight, and Siegfried, together with the protagonist, ultimately prevail. But then, as agreed before the battle, Siegfried then joins Kriemhild, apologizing for not taking her feelings into consideration before arranging for his own death, and now trying his best to make up for that. He fights together with Kriemhild against Chaldea, wishing to be there for her in this final moment, even if it is a battle they cannot win, especially if you fight that battle with Super Orion and Double Coin Skya like I did. Still, it is a nice way to end their long-running feud. It may be a story that was created only because the writers changed Siegfried's original lore, but as I've said many times with characters like Oberon and Lancer Artoria, just because an FGO character veers off from their original legend, that doesn't mean we get a bad storyline. In fact, we often get quite good ones. And now for the verdict. What grade would I give Siegfried's depiction in Fate Grand Order and the wider Fate franchise? Well, his character design and skill set are pretty solid, with plenty of links to his original lore. It is a little weird that they partially turn him into a dragon in his final ascension, but that's not a deal breaker. But when it comes to characterization, the fact is that they changed Siegfried's story quite a bit from the original, especially when it comes to how he died. Because he blamed himself for the feud between Brunhild and Kriemhild, that he then arranged for his own death, and then didn't tell Kriemhild he was doing that, and so leading her to go down a bloody quest for revenge that was ultimately unnecessary, we get a character who sees himself as responsible for causing trouble for others, hence why he gets the nickname of Sumanai for apologizing so much. Outside of the meme, he is still a very formidable and noble warrior. More noble than in his original myth, I think. Siegfried is not the first character I have covered who has had his involvement in sexual assault glossed over in Fate, and he certainly will not be the last. But by changing Siegfried into this doormat who grants other people's wishes, even his own death when it is asked for, that has consequences. Consequences that I will be exploring in my next video. And so for a final grade, I am going to give Siegfried, the hero of the Nibelungenlied, a D-. I was considering setting him on fire, 
but the last time I tried that with a Dragon Slayer, I was nearly killed. Anyway, this video is a little different from my usual ones, in that it's going to have a direct sequel. You can consider this video on Siegfried part one of a two-part series, with part two being the next video on Krimhild. Until next time.